Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. Hope everyone is staying well and safe out there. And we'd like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Real World Data Governance with Bob Seiner. Today, Bob will be discussing data governance and three levels of metadata management. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen for that feature. And for questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen or via Twitter uh, we, using hashtag RWDG. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for this series, Bob Seiner. Bob is the President and Principal of KIK Consulting and Educational Services and the publisher of the Data Administration Newsletter, tdan.com. Bob has been a recipient of the DEMA Professional Award for Significant and Demonstrable Contributions to the Data Management Industry. Bob specializes in non-invasive data governance, data stewardship, and metadata management solutions. And with that, I will give the floor to Bob to get today's webinar started. Bob, hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Hi, everybody. I hope everybody, I'm going to echo what Shannon said and echo that I hope everybody is staying safe and well where you are. And I greatly appreciate your spending the next hour with us. And we got a great topic for today. We're going to be talking about data governance and the three levels of metadata management, as Shannon has spoken about uh, or as has told us already. So um, to get us started today, let me see. Ah, there we go. Um, before I get started, what I'd like to do is share a couple of things that I, I typically share with you before the webinar starts. First of all, thank you for attending the Real World Data Governance webinar series. It's on the third Thursday of every month. And next month, we're going to be talking about using tools to advance your data governance program. Also, I talk a lot about non-invasive data governance. And if you're interested in learning more about non-invasive data governance, you can find the book called Non-Invasive Data Governance, The Path of Least Resistance and Greatest Success, and you can find it at your favorite bookseller. Um, I'll be speaking at a couple of data diversity events that are coming up soon. Um, Enterprise Data World taking place in October this year. Next month, I'll be speaking at that event, and I'll also be speaking at the DGIQ, Data Governance and Information Quality Conference. These are virtual events, and that will be taking place in December. Um, want to let you know, and I think I had talked about the fact that it was going to be coming out soon in the last webinar, that I now have a new learning plan that's available through the Dataversity Training Center, and it is called Glossaries, Dictionaries, and Catalogs. And it'll be particularly of interest to you uh, because it's a, a big topic of, this, of the conversation in today's webinar. We'll be talking about uh, business glossaries and dictionaries and catalogs as kind of being those three levels of metadata management that we're going to um, be referring to throughout the webinar. Um, the Data Administration Newsletter, if you're not familiar with it, please go out to tdan.com. It's free. There's lots of great information on there. It's been, I've been publishing this publication since 1997. And around KIK Consulting and Educational Services, I call that the home of non-invasive data governance. And a couple of things to say about that. If you notice one thing different about this slide or the slides, I've got a new logo for KIK Consulting. And the fact is that next week, I will, we'll be unveiling a new version of the KIK Consulting and Educational um, uh, Services website. So please uh, take a look at kikconsulting.com next week and you'll learn a lot more about non-invasive data governance, non-invasive metadata governance, and you just might find some things out there about glossaries, dictionaries, and data catalogs as well. So in today's webinar, I'm going to share these topics with you. I'm going to talk about these things. First, I'm going to talk about the three levels of metadata and how, they're differ how they differ from each other and how there may be some similarities between them as well. We'll talk about the sources of the metadata, the places that you can go to get the metadata to, to complete or to fulfill each of those different levels of metadata. I'll be talking about a, the, the linkage between the levels, so it's important to link up your glossaries and your dictionaries and your data catalogs, and I'll share uh, examples of that with you. I'll talk about processes to govern all levels of metadata and then talk about institutionalizing policy 
to make certain that you have quality metadata at all of these levels and at actually all of the levels of metadata that you'll be recording in, uh, or in your repositories or in your data catalogs or in your tools. I, another object that I will be presenting today for the first time is a new semantic framework associated with these three levels, and it will might help you to put uh, your organization in a better position to focus on these three different levels of metadata. I'll be sharing that with you coming up here in, in a couple of minutes. So the first thing that I want to talk about today are the three levels of metadata and how they are different from each other and how they are the same. And, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the advantages of using the different levels. A common term that's used happens to be common business language, and a lot of organizations are talking about getting the terminology and the semantics to be uh, consistent across the organization. So I'll talk about common business language. I'll share with you that semantic framework that I was just mentioning and talk about the three levels that are associated with it. We'll talk about the importance of each of the different levels and we'll talk about associating the levels with the different tools. And the reason why you see the number three and then the number four and then the number three again on the screen is that I've gone back and forth. Do I wanna add a fourth level of metadata management? And I think that we can keep it to the three and I'll relate the fourth to it when I share the framework with you. So what are some of the reasons why we wanna have different levels of metadata? Well, first thing that we wanna do is simplify the understanding for the organization. All of us that have focused on metadata management or who need to focus on metadata management understand that there's a lot of different types of metadata that are out there. And if we kind of try to present that picture to people within the business or even in the technical community, there's a lot of confusion and they think that it's very complex. So if we can simplify the understanding for people across the organization, we certainly want to do that. And not only do we want to do that, but we want to imitate what the traditional viewpoint is of the most important metadata that we can collect to assist us in moving forward with governing data across our organization. So we certainly wanna make it something that the people in the business areas can refer to and, and that it's relatable to them and what they do. We wanna keep in mind that we're capturing this metadata for a purpose. We're capturing it to make it available to people in the organization. So we need to think about or keep in mind the idea of navigation. How are people going to come into the metadata how are they going to navigate from one level to the other? How are they going to find the information about the data that they need to be helpful and successful in completing their job function, uh, creating reports, and whatever it is that they have to do? And you'll notice that when I share the framework, that there's a, a specific column set up for standards, and then there's uh, other columns that are set up for resources. And I'll talk about that in a little bit, but when it comes to business terminology, we want a standard. When it comes to the attributes and the elements of data that we care about in our organization, we want to have standards. But the fact is that the different resources, the reports and the systems that we have throughout our environment, they might not call it the same thing. So we need to be able to relate these standard terms and what they're called, and we're going to need to relate them to the aliases for these things across the organization. It's called this in one system. It's called that in another system. It shows up as something completely different in a report. So we want to keep that in mind when we are building out the three levels of metadata. So I want to kind of begin by talking about common business language and how it becomes so important for organizations to get on the same page and call things the same thing. Is it a customer? Is it a client? Is it a prospect? When does a prospect become a client? All of those things are inherent in the definition of the, the these common business language that we use in our organizations to improve the value and the understanding of data across the organization. So I'm sharing with you a definition that actually came from a very old page on the data administration newsletter, a definition of what common business language is. And uh, I'll just kind of walk through it real quickly with you. It's a common business language that en enables companies to drive consistent, well understood metrics across the organization, helping to reduce the time and budget required to analyze the information and actually turn it into something that is usable within the organization. So it's really, we can take that definition and break it into pieces, driving to consistency. I think that's what we mean by the common 
the word common in common business language is we want people to call things the same thing as much as we can so that when people ask questions, they're getting answers that are similar based on common understanding across the organization. So driving to consistency, that's one of the whole reasons why organizations focus on having a common business language. And it also helps us to understand when we're performing metrics uh, or we're looking to measure the effectiveness of governance or whatever we're measuring within the organization. We want to be talking about the same thing. So common business language is really inherent in this whole framework. We need to make certain that we have a standard and that we know what it is associated with actually out there in the reality of our databases and systems and on reports. And we want it to be consistent across the organization. The idea is to reduce the time and the budget that's required to perform the analysis on the data. People talk about the 80-20 rule, how people spend 80% of their time manipulating the data and getting the data the way that they need it in order to do the analysis that they are so well versed in. So we want to reduce that time and therefore the cost of getting that data to the point where people can analyze it and turn that information into intelligence within the organization. So when I'm going to share with you the, the, the semantic framework and the three levels, well, there's basically the three levels are the business terminology, again, going back to the common business language, the business attribute, which is kind of a breakdown of the different terminology. What information do we have about a customer? What information do we have about a product? Or what groups of information do we have? And then what specific elements of, of information and data do we have that pertain to that attribute group and as it pertains to the term? So you'll see that the linkage between these things and the relationships between the levels will become vital in making this information available, making this information helpful to the people in the organization that we're hoping will get the most value out of it. So you ready? I was going to have a recording of a drum roll here, but here it is. Here is the new framework that I want to speak to. And you'll see it's rather simple in the way that it's set up. You've got the far left column. You've got the, the two columns to the right. And the first column in specific, uh, specifically is about the standards. What are we going to call something? What is the subject area of information? What is the the, the terminology that we're using across the organization, what are the attributes or what is an attribute of that specific business term? And then how is that represented in the systems themselves? So if you see the, the different colors associated with each of these different blocks, we've got the data tool. So we're gonna talk about data domains here in a minute, but then we've got the, the tool of the glossary and the dictionary and the catalog. And we've got standards for what we want to call these things. How do we want to name data elements across the organization, as an example? But then we've got this information that already resides in different resources across the organization. So you've got a data dictionary for system one, and you've got reports that are associated with system one. And they might not be called the same thing that is the standard, but hey, wouldn't it be great if business people could navigate from the the subject area into the glossary, into the dictionary, and then into the catalog. And you've got multiple systems that potentially house the same data or say, similarly, at least conceptual data across the organization. Things that are where we have uh, silos of information that have different names and may have some different meanings or different values across the organization. So this is the, the simple framework that I wanted to share with you. And it's, it becomes really valuable to be able to plug in examples of what subject areas of data are we talking about? What are the business terms? What are the attributes? And what are the, the elements that are associated with those attributes? And that really plays well into the whole concept of the business glossary and the data dictionary and then the data catalog. The fact is the data catalog can be a lot bigger than just the specifics about data within a specific data resource. But for this example, you know, we I put catalog there as being kind of the physical representation of the data that we have as attributes and then we have as terminology and within a subject area within our organization. So if you look just at the left side of that diagram, and that's what I'm showing on the screen now, is that it's very important and it, it requires that we have governance in place for us to be able to create standards for these things. I have a client that I'm working with now that is 
struggling between market and segment and vertical. They have all these different names for what they're calling um, the different um, potential clients that they have out there in the, in the world, basically. And when people want to know, well, what are our verticals? What are our markets? You know, what are the segments that we are, are focusing on? You know, it's important to, again, come up with a common business language and capture that information. And we'll just use as an example here on the screen that we'll talk about market and then the market profile. What are the things that we need to know about the market? And then what are the physical pieces of data that we have that, that allude to the market and the market profile for the organization? So that's just the far left-hand side of the, of, the, uh, of the framework. And if we just take away the top level, that's the domain, that's the subject area. We don't necessarily need a level of metadata for that. So even though I say it was three and then I thought about, well, do we want to add domain as the fourth? Now nah, we'll keep it at the three, but I thought it was worthwhile to share that domain or that subject area within the, uh, within the, the framework that I'm sharing with you now. So when we look at the bottom part of the framework, that's where the business attributes. Uh, we have, would have something called market code that has a specific size, and or that size perhaps could pertain to the business element. You, it would be up to you as to how you would represent that within the standard. But then we've got the different resources in the organization where this data is already residing on reports within databases. So I call it a resource attribute. I call it a resource element. But the fact is that that could be a that could be a report, that could be a database, that could be an information system, and oftentimes the data dictionaries really are outlining well what data resides within the data warehouse or within a specific application. Very rarely, at least from my experience, have I seen a single data dictionary for the entire organization. Typically, a data dictionary is very resource specific, and then the catalog of information would also be you know, specific to the, the database or the report that you are focusing on. And you'll see that there's linkages between these things, and we'll talk a little bit about those, uh, a little bit more about those in, in a couple minutes here. So let's talk about the importance of, of each of these different levels. So I kind of grayed out the subject area. These are the buckets of data. These are the things that the subject areas, the subject matters, the domains of data that are, are used, again, you can just refer to them as, as the different sets of data, the buckets of data around the organization. And typically, that's where the business community is going to start. What information do we have about this? Where, what's the standard? What do we call it in this specific system? So when I'm running a report, I know where to get to that information. So the first level, you know, that, that top piece that's not even truly a level, the subject area is important because that's where navigation starts in the organization. And then it comes to the terminology. And I spoke a little bit about common business language and terminology a little bit earlier in the webinar. Um, so we need to know, we know that we need to have that common business language and those business terms. And I'll talk in a minute about where are we going to get these terms from? Um, what is a process that we might put in place to assure that these, this terminology is appropriate for the organization? And then there's the attributes themselves. Uh, you know, those are going to be um, specific to a business resource, like a system, like a report. If I'm going to pull up this report, which column do I look for on the report? Or if it's a graphical database, where do I look on the graphical database to find the information about this specific attribute? And then the data elements are, are again, data resource specific. It could be the information of what is that column called? What is that field called within a database or a table or within a report? So I know there's four levels here, and the domain isn't really a level, but it's truly important if we're going to give people the ability to be able to navigate down through the three levels of metadata to get to the information that they need to help them to locate and understand the most appropriate data that's available to them to help them to perform their job function. So let's associate these levels with the tools. Again, the data domains, they're typically included in all three, the glossary, the dictionary, and the catalog. But the, the terminology, at least in the organizations that I've uh, had the, the privilege of working with, that's the business glossary. That's the term, the common business language and the terminology is housed in the business glossary. 
And in the data dictionary, that's where we're going to store that specific information about that specific resource, whether it's a system or a report or a database or uh, you know whatever it is that is a, a set of, uh, uh, of information that's being utilized by the business. And then the data catalog being the third of those three tools is the data resource specific. And that's the one, and we'll talk a little bit about it in a minute, where you know, if we can, we'd like to automate the ability for the connectors between the, the resources, the, the database catalogs and the things that we have in our organization and the systems and the models and relate those and, and actually ingest that information into the data catalog. So those three levels actually perfectly align with the whole concept of a business glossary, common business language, the dictionary, about a specific resource, and then the catalog. What is the physical representation of that information across the organization? So now that I've outlined the three different levels for you, I wanna talk a little bit about where can we go to get this information to populate our glossary and our dictionary and our catalog. So the truth is there might already be resources within your organization that you can go to to pull the, the metadata out of these sources and load them into your glossaries, dictionaries, and catalogs, or maybe those don't exist. So I had a recent conversation with a client that was quite interesting where they told me they don't have any metadata, and they happen to be a very big DB2, Oracle, SQL Server shop, and they have a lot of data in these different types of databases, and they don't necessarily, or they didn't recognize that the database catalogs for these tools are metadata. So I had to argue with them, or at least to disagree lightly with them, and tell them that, yeah, you do have metadata. The problem is that it's inherent in these tools. And if we wanna make this information available to people so they can get the most value out of their data, we need to get that metadata out of those tools, at least the specific metadata that's gonna add value for the business community. So don't say that there's no sources. I'm gonna share with you a couple of different sources for each of these different types of uh, of tools that you might be considering. Again, the glossary, the dictionary, and the catalog. And I'll spend a minute talking about preparing to use these tools. Well, what can we do in the meantime while we're waiting to see or we're trying to get budget to bring in these tools or get the opportunity to leverage some of the tools that we have within our organization? So, you know, we want to make certain that we're thinking in advance, we're being consistent in how we're capturing this information so that we actually have. Uh, have it prepared so that when we bring in a tool that it will be easy to ingest that information into the tool. So, um, so like I said, there could be industry related terms. The, the most important thing is that you begin a list. You begin a list of the subject areas within your organization. Begin a list of the term, uh, build a list of the terminology that's important. And I'll talk about where you might get that list from in a second capturing the list in an ingestible format. That's what I was talking about is put it into some type of a format that you're gonna be able to bring into your repository or into your catalog or, or dictionary or, or glossary tool. And utilize your existing tools like spreadsheets are a very simple way to be able to capture the metadata in a consistent manner so you can propel your, prepare yourself to be able to load this information into your um, tool, any of the three tools that I just mentioned, or into your database catalog or whatever it is that you're going to be acquiring or utilizing within your organization to, to help to make this information available to people. So let's talk about some sources of the business glossary. And again, that's the terminology. These are what we are calling things within the organization. It is the common business language. And there's many places that you can go for this information. In fact, I had an, a client recently that built a team of pretty high level people to go out, because this was very important to them, to build out what are the specific business terms that we use. And where were some of the places that they went to get that terminology? Well, they went to industry standards. One thing that's not shared on the screen is industry models, uh, data models for, that are specific to um, different types of business. They have terminology in them. They may not be the terminology that you presently use, but it, it might be a, just a place for you to be able to locate terminology. There's employee reference manuals, customer reference guides. 
you know, user manuals and handbooks. You can go to your organization's website and see what terminology are we using that we want to share so we can get not only our internal customers, you know, people that we work with within the organization and the data scientists and the analysts to be on the same page, but we also want the business community and we want the client community to be speaking the same language. You know, one of the things that I'm finding are really uh, important right now is the self-service business intelligence within organizations, actually to the, to the customers, where they can go and they can find the data that they need to make a proper order within the organization. So we might wanna be consistent in how we're using that terminology, you know, consistent with what we're calling it on those things that are the front end or the face to, of our organization to people. And you can bring people together and you can have brainstorming sessions or brain dump sessions and start to catalog, you know, what are the specific objects of information. So it's not that difficult to start identifying what some of the key business terms are. And again, you're not going to necessarily focus on every single term within the organization, but you're going to want to focus on the specific terminology that is important to your organization first and build repeatable processes and repeatable methods for being able to take that information and make it available through metadata in one of these three different levels, in one of these three different tools that I'm talking about today. So where could we go to get information from data dictionaries? So you could have native documentation, things that you're already collecting within spreadsheets and standards and things that you uh, have already recorded over the years and hopefully have kept up to date. But you could have the data documentation in different native platforms in access databases, for example, within your organization. Certainly the vendors and the systems will typically when you're acquiring a system or you're acquiring a, a module from an organization, uh, from a vendor, they're gonna have some documentation as to what the data is and perhaps what the data even means. Now the question is, is that gonna be consistent with how you're using that information? So it might require some changes on your part, but it is a source of information that you can use to populate a data dictionary. And I mentioned spreadsheets and lists of standards of terms, Data models are another place. It was when I got started in the field of metadata management, that's what we focused on for first. It was the conceptual information, which was more along the terminology, the logical, physical, the logical data models, which was more along the attributes of the information, and then the physical models, which were actually the databases and how the databases were constructed across the organization. So all of these places listed on the screen now are potential sources of information to populate data dictionaries. And it's very important to be very consistent in how you collect the information in these dictionaries, as one of my present clients is finding out as they try to ingest information into a bunch of different tools to see which tool is most appropriate for them. Well, they wanna be consistent in how they're capturing that information so we don't have to redefine the process of getting this information into into the tool of choice, you know, we want to be able to set up a kind of a repeatable script within the organization to take the metadata from however we're capturing that information presently and ingesting it into the tool. And then there's the database catalog. And again, I talk about na native data documentation that you might have about the specific physical data within your organization. The database catalogs are a great place to go certainly having a connector between the tool that you're using and the database catalog makes a lot of sense because that's where you're going to go to get, well, what is the physical name of the table? What is the physical name of the data element? And spreadsheets and data models, you know, where the physical data models are, are of particular interest when it comes to the data catalog sources for your organization. And again, we're talking about, you know, business and resource specific elements of information across the organization. And I can't emphasize enough. I know that the, the framework is important uh, and it's a big part of, of this session now, but you know, one thing that I'd really like you to be able to take away from this session is if you don't have a tool right now, or if you're looking at tools or you, you need to budget for them. And so it's a little bit down the road as to when you're gonna be able to acquire a tool. You can start right now by governing that metadata. So you wanna capture it consistently. I talked about capturing it consistently within the data, within a spreadsheet. You know, as I said, a, a client right now has 
different data dictionaries for different products that they have within their organization. And they're doing their darndest to keep those things consistent. So when they write a script to ingest this information into their tool, they can use that format and they don't have to rewrite the script for each source of metadata that they're going to collect and ingest into their tool. So you wanna manage, or at least you wanna consider managing and storing this information that you're collecting centrally. So you have a one resource or one place where people can go to get the different data dictionaries that we have about different aspects of our data warehouse or our data lake or different products and systems that we have in the organization. The biggest takeaway is govern the metadata early so that you're gonna be prepared when you get to that point where you bring a tool into your organization. So I talked about the business terms. Uh, I talked about the, the business attributes. I talk about the business elements, but these things being connected together are extremely important as well. So we're gonna spend a minute talking about the importance of the linkage. We'll talk about the different types of links that take place even in just in the semantic model. And I'm gonna bring back up the semantic model here in a minute just to share with you and highlight the parts of the model that, that make the connections between the subject area and the terms and the, the terms and the attributes and the attributes and the elements. So we'll talk about each of those here real quickly. But first I wanna talk about the importance of having the linkage. So it makes it possible for people in the organization to, to be able to drill down from a search term that they use and navigate through the metadata to get to the information that they need to help them to perform their job function. And that's a, one of the basic capabilities that you'll find in any tool that is claiming to be a glossary or a dictionary or a catalog is the ability to be able to navigate through the tool. So these linkages are those navigations. The relationships between different things within the products is something that's gonna be a key piece of any proof of concept or pilot of these tools. So we wanna make certain that we have the ability to add objects and link them to things like, for example, data stewards and different levels of data stewards and what are they responsible for or owners, whatever you call them. You wanna be able to create those objects within the tools and connect them to the things that have meaning within the organization. So there's the, the importance of the linkage between the subject areas and the glossary terms between the terms and the attributes, the attributes and the elements. And not only that, but as I mentioned before, we have aliases for things. We call something as a standard, this is what we're going to call it, but we, we actually physically call them something different. And we need to be able to say, okay, we wanna move forward with this standard moving forward, but we want to also see how is this information already represented within the tools. So we wanna, uh, between the terms and between the attributes, and I've even had a client recently who has made rela has built relationships in their catalog between the domains and between the terms. So we wanna make certain that we're focusing on those links and we have given the uh, end users the ability to be able to navigate across these links. So the first one I wanna talk about is that relationship between the glossary and the dictionary. And the most important thing is it enables search and enables people to find the information. They can drill down from the terms, they can digest different pieces of the business and find out what information and what data is available about that specific term. Um, and also, you know, if you follow a framework like the one that I shared with you, you might also have standard names for the terms and you wanna connect those as well to what these things are called within the, uh, the different resources that I talked about earlier across the organization. And then there's the relationships between the dictionary objects themselves, the standard attribute name, what are we calling it in this system? How is it represented on this report? And oftentimes these links between the dictionary objects are some of the most important for our organization. What is an alias? You know, why are we getting different, different results from reports when we ask the same question of multiple people across the organization. Well, maybe they're going to data that they think is the same, but it's actually different. And how are we gonna know that? Well, we call it one thing in one system, we call it something else in another system, the attributes are different, the values are different, the, the, the dictionary objects become that common linking point across the organization. And at the term level, as we have connections between the terms, those are really logical aliases. This is not 
now down into the data yet. These are the common um, aliases of what do we call things in different places in the organization. So logically, they may be the same or may be close. There's a difference between those and the physical aliases, which I'll talk about uh, again in, in a second here. But then there's the relationship between the dictionary and the catalog itself. So once people have recognized the attributes that they care most about within the organization, where is the data about that? What pieces of data do we have about that? So enabling the drill down from the attributes to the elements. Again, I've already spoken about the, the need to have standard attribute names and standard element names. And one of the common questions that we get from the business community is what data do we have about whatever it is, what the subject or about address or about market or you know, even something as particular as the last name of a person. What is it called in the different systems? And you know, what's the size of the field and how much room do I need to leave when I report? You know, they want to be able to answer that question of what data, what metadata do we have about these specific objects? And then there's the relationship between the items at the catalog level. The standard element name, what is the, the, the standard name that we want to use for that specific piece of data moving forward, or what's the common one that we want to at least link the aliases to? That's the standard element name. And then we also recognize that we call these things different things in different systems. So we've got resource specific element names. Again, it's a common linking point, And these are the things that I would refer to as being the physical aliases. Physically, within a database, it's called something different. So if you're running a report against a new resource and I want, something, I want the data about something in specific, we need to be able to link from the standard element, from the standard attribute to what these things are called within these different systems. So these linkage, all these lines that connect the different pieces of the framework that's on the right-hand side are extremely important. And sometimes it's easy to ingest that information in through the spreadsheets. Sometimes it takes a manual effort for you to go in and to collect that information and to enter that into the repository or into the catalog tool that you're using. So let's talk about the processes that need to be in place to govern all the different le levels of metadata, specifically the three that we're talking about here. And the first thing I'm gonna talk about is, the pro is just regular processes versus governed processes. You know, oftentimes a process itself is a form of governance, but only if it becomes formal and we're associating and engaging the, 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 the similar role at the similar time. So a process itself is metadata if you're keeping track of what steps we're following. So we'll talk about processes, versus just regular processes versus governed processes and what does it mean to govern a process. We'll talk about some processes that are specific to the business glossary the data dictionary and the data catalog. And then I'll spend a second talking about building your metadata toolkit. What things can you build that are repeatable so you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you go down this path and start collecting information to ingest into these tools. So the first we'll talk about processes versus governed processes. And we need to do that for, for both data processes and metadata processes because you know, and I say all the time that the data won't govern itself, the metadata won't govern itself, we need to have people involved in it and they need to know what to do in order to capture the information about the data in the organization. There's metadata processes that are focused on that data documentation to make certain that that data documentation is collected and that it is shareable across the organization. Then there's steps that, you know, do we want to redefine the steps each time that we're collecting metadata or do we want to collect in our toolkit a series of repeatable steps? And then there's informal accountability. Oh, these people know that they need to be involved at this point versus formal accountability. And that's probably one of the biggest, uh, biggest items when it comes to just normal processes versus uh, governed processes is going from the informal level of accountability to a formal level of accountability. And organizations have process silos versus building consistent processes across the organization. Again, we have a method for doing something. We want to collect that information and store it somewhere within one of these tools to make certain people understand there is a process for this that's been validated, that's been vetted out, that's been certified, that we've used repeatedly. So we want to, rather than just continuing to redefine processes every time they need to be created, 
there's a consistent process that we can put in our toolkit and call out, hey, we did this for somebody else in the organization, we can do this for you. So having a repository of those consistent processes is extremely important. And when it comes to a, you know, a federated model of implementing governance, we wanna make certain that you know, we understand that there's a lot of autonomy around the organization for people doing things the way that they've always done them and not necessarily gravitating towards a standard way of doing something. So oftentimes in a federated approach, we're gonna define minimal standards and guidelines and things that we want to share with people across the organization and leave it up to them as to how they go out and accomplish those things. But at least as long as they follow the minimal guidelines, for example, for collecting the metadata that we're going to ingest into the tool or into any of these tools, you know, that might be the federated approach is that you provide them a template and say, put your metadata in this format. We don't care how you get it into that format, but at the end of the day, we need it in that format in order for us to be able to ingest that information into the product. So let's talk about some of the processes associated with a business glossary. And you'll notice that the processes associated with a business glossary are very similar to the, the processes associated with the data dictionary. Number one, you might have a process to review, validate, and certify terms. I spoke a, a minute or a few minutes ago about a, a client that had built a team of people to go out and biz, build their business terminology. Well, they also uh, they figured that they were going to do it for a customer and provider. It was a health insurance information uh, health insurance company, but they wanted to be able to repeat this for different areas of the organization, different terminology. So they build processes to review and to validate and to certify the terms. They build processes for people to add new business terms. It wasn't just made available for anybody at any time. They wanted to govern the information that was within their glossary. So they built and defined and followed a process to add new business terms or to remove a business term or to change a business term or to maintain it, to let people know when was the last time this piece of information was reviewed across the organization. And if you'll notice in the dictionary processes, it's very similar, or should I say it's the same as the glossary processes I just talked about, but we're focusing on the elements and we're focusing on the attributes within the organization and not necessarily the terminology. So if somebody, there should be a process, and I think most of you would agree that if you're gonna go change something in a database, it's going to have an impact on reports, on other databases, we need to make certain that we put a, a, a repeatable process in place to make certain that we can maintain these things and that there's a process for requesting change to specific data within a database. So in uh, different organizations, they put processes in place in order to add new pieces of data or to remove pieces of data. All of a sudden the data is not there and somebody doesn't have access to information they've utilized. We want to know who's going to be impacted by that. So the importance of creating these processes um, really come bubbles to the top. You know, we need to know that we can do these things again and again and again. But when it comes to the data catalog, that's where we're hearing a lot in the industry about automated capabilities. How can these tools kind of use their connectors and their spiders to go out into these different products and collect the metadata that's important to them? And we don't want to have to physically enter that information into the catalog. I don't know of too many companies that will do that, but we want to automate that capability of pulling that information into the tool versus the manual load and the manual update or, or semi-automate. You know, when you're looking at these types of tools, you're going to want to look at the automation. That's an important piece of ingesting information into the tool. And if you're not, this is not information we're housing in spreadsheets. This is information that's inherent within the meta models that represent the metadata and the data that's collected within these tools. So think about automating wherever you can. The, uh, the ingestion of the data catalog information into the tool, and you may have a specific process for that. And you might set up change management so that when there's changes to databases and there's changes to reports, that we, we hear about that and we know to update the metadata accordingly so that we're not providing the wrong information to people across the organization. And as we do, as we build these repeatable processes, they become part of your metadata toolkit. So the other things that are parts of your metadata toolkit is 
having a repeatable place for people to collect the metadata. Again, for example, you know, having a similar spreadsheet that, or, that parts of the organization use to document the data within a specific data resource, repeatable processes for defining what metadata we're collecting, uh, producing that metadata and using that metadata, you know, uh, defined accountability, who is responsible for de deciding what metadata we're gonna use across the organization. Who's gonna be responsible for producing that metadata? Do we build it into their job function? How can we assure that when we add, for example, new data to our data lake, that it's not just out there and only a few people know about it, especially if we've gone through the process of making certain that that, met, that data in that tool is important and is valuable. So defining the accountability is part of the toolkit, including who does what and when they do it, that's the, really the way. That's the formal process versus the informal process. Um, repeatable metadata ingestion processes, being able to create um, one script to, to grab this information and pull it into the repository. So I mentioned change management and validation. I mean, those are extremely important. Once you've loaded a data dictionary into your repository, into your catalog, it's a snapshot of a point in time. And we wanna make certain that we're thinking about, well, if that changes, how are we going to reflect that change within the tool? So metadata change management is critical. I learned the hard way when I was a repository administrator many, many years ago, where we loaded information into the repository seven days a week, 24 hours a day, but we hadn't built the change management. So let this be kind of a, a warning to you or that, that you wanna make certain that you, when you put these tools out there and you make them available to people, that, you, um, that you're, you're putting those change management and process, processes in place before you share this information. So when we talk about the different processes, again, going back to the framework that I shared with you earlier, you know, all of these blocks on the screen within the framework are, are, have processes for defining, producing, and using this metadata. And we need to document what those processes are and be consistent. That is what is really termed as metadata governance, is making certain that we have people um, that are responsible for defining, producing, and using the metadata that's gonna be utilized by the organization. But I'll take it one step further, and I'll say that every one of these links, the link between the subject area and the term, the link between the term and the attribute, and between attributes that are in different parts of the organization, there needs to be a process in place to define what relationships are important, to produce those relationships, and to, to help people to understand how they can use that information across the organization. So the last subject I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly is institutionalizing policy to show that you have quality metadata at all levels. So the first thing is, you know, when is a policy necessary, recognizing when it's, in, when it's necessary. And then I wanna share with you two ways that a policy adds value and reasons why you might wanna have a policy, the details of what goes into a policy and how they are all focused on executing authority and formalizing accountability, my two favorite definitions for what governance is and what stewardship is. Executing authority is governance and formalizing accountability is stewardship. And then I'll spend a minute talking about institutionalizing these policies. So when do we need a policy within our organization? Well, you know, you could tell us when, uh, when is the policy necessary? Are you a policy driven organization? Are you policy centric? Um, that that would, could dictate whether or not you need to have a metadata policy for your organization. The policy is necessary when you need to define the procedures, define the accountability, to demonstrate that your leadership supports metadata. And you'll see on the next slide, I wanna focus on that key bullet right there, the demonstration of the leadership. It's one of the reasons why organizations put policy in place so we can help them to understand what is important because your executives aren't gonna sign off on something that's not important. If they're signing off on a metadata quality policy, or even a data governance policy, that's representing that they are interested in that and that they feel that it's important enough to have policy about. And then a policy is necessarily when you wanna formalize the execution and enforcement of authority for anything across your organization and metadata would be one of those things. So this slide, and I don't think I've ever presented this this way before, is there's really two ways that a, a policy adds value for your organization. The first one is the one that everybody thinks about, articulating the process and the guidelines and the accountability 
for doing specific things across the organization. That's the one that you know a lot of the sample policies that I've sent I've seen articulate the process, the guidelines, and the accountability. But the most important, perhaps, is the demonstration of your leadership as to the, that they are behind this. A data governance policy that there's going to be a policy around data governance or data management, and that you expect it to be signed off at it's at the highest level of the organization. They're not going to sign off on it unless they feel confident that this is important enough for your organization to have policy about. So this includes metadata policy associated with all the different types of metadata that I've talked about today. So articulating the process and the guidelines, yeah, that's important. Demonstrating leadership, support, sponsorship, and understanding, that's just as important. And, and, and you know, the, the policy is really where the buck stops when it gets to the executives. They're the ones that are going to tell you whether or not a policy is going to be necessary, and if they're going to support it, that really demonstrates to the organization that these are really, uh, this is something that's important consideration for our organization. So what goes into a metadata policy? I wanted to share some of those things, a purpose and a scope, you know, who's responsible for what, you know, definitions of terms that you're using within the policy. It's always good to have a list of what those definitions are. What policies does this policy relate to? What are the procedures? the exceptions, the enforcement, when has this policy been revised? That in itself is kind of a good straw man for what should go into a policy of any kind. Um, and in, especially when it comes to a metadata policy, we need to be able to make certain that we've defined who does what and when do they do it. So I always talk about my definition of data governance being the execution and enforcement of, of, of authority over the management of data and as stewardship as being the formalization of accountability, this is really the governance of the metadata. You want to execute and enforce authority over the metadata in your organization because it's not going to create itself. In the stewardship, you would need to have formal accountability. People need to have formal accountability in order for this metadata to be collected. So the idea is stay as non-invasive as you can while you're doing this, but do try to move from whatever informal setup you have if your metadata is an issue in your organization to move to a more formal setup. Um, establish the policy as kind of the norm for your organization. Socialize the concept of, of the fact that metadata needs to be governed. You know, communicate this across the organization in orientation, onboarding, and ongoing types of media that you use to, to conduct your communications. Formalize your stewardship for, for the metadata and for the data and measure and evaluate and enhance this information over time. So in this webinar, I know it went kind of quickly, at least it felt that way for me, I shared the three levels of metadata and how they differ, the sources of metadata at each of the levels, the importance of the linkage between the levels in this semantic model, the processes that you should be considering in order to govern all levels of the metadata, and then thinking about using a policy again to demonstrate executive support, articulate executive support for the need to govern this information because, again, it's not going to govern itself. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Shannon to see if we had any questions today. Bob, thank you so much for another fantastic presentation as always. And uh, just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants for this webinar by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording as well as anything else requested. Um, you know, we had a lot of great questions coming in. Um, to dive in here, um, how can metadata help in digital transformation of higher education? Yeah, that's kind of specific, the digital transformation of higher education. Well, I know from experience of working with organizations in higher ed that they haven't really traditionally done a great job of, of collecting information, of, of collecting the metadata. Um, that doesn't seem to be the business that they're in, but more and more these days, the higher ed organizations are seeing that that data is an important asset, the information that they have about the data, the analytics that in order to improve analytics, that they become important. So uh, I think it, it becomes inherent in them uh, when they're recognizing that data is important to higher education, just like it's important to any industry, that we need to put formality in place around the metadata associated with higher ed data. 
or whatever type of data your organization has. So um, that is the, the movement of the future in higher ed. As higher ed becomes more and more competitive, what we know about our students, what we know about our faculty, um, what we do analytics, and where our students are coming from. You know, we want to be able to do analytics on that specific data. So it just increases the importance of having this type of information for people across the organization. And have you seen any organizations crowdsource their catalog similar to Wikipedia format? Um, there are some tools that, that have kind of that focus to it. Um, not specifically that, that are, link, are, are like Wikipedia. In Wikipedia, you can jump between subjects. You can jump all over the organization, but that takes a lot of work. I mean, it doesn't, those links, again, are not going to connect to themselves. They're not going to, the hyperlinks are not going to connect themselves. So I guess the easy answer or the simple answer to that question is, I haven't seen too many organizations provide their catalog in a Wikipedia style. But that's what so many of us are used to now when we're looking up information, even though Wikipedia isn't necessarily the know-all and be-all source for us to go to. If we can strive to that, if we can customize that for our organization, then I would say that is something that we should be considering. And perhaps there will be a movement of tools in the future to look more like Wikipedia than the kind of standard graphical database or just relational databases that they're presently using. So I haven't seen it, but I wouldn't be surprised if somebody out there is providing that type of a product. And Bob, what are the challenges and opportunities of using different level of metadata and what are the advantages of using all levels in business organizations? Well, you know, I think that the business people want to know what data they should, they're using and what data is available to them. And so the biggest advantage of doing it is in the levels is that you, they're more like bite-sized pieces of, of creating this for the entire organization. You may start with your business terminology. You may already have data dictionaries for specific applications. So you know, the business value that comes from this is it makes information about the data available to people that are going to utilize it to perform their job function, as I mentioned earlier. So that is the biggest business value is that we're taking the data that's always been thought of as being IT's responsibilities and we're putting some responsibility on the business community to help them to understand the data better and to better leverage the data. We put a lot of money and investments into building analytical platforms and data lakes and data warehouses. And the real return on investment from these investments comes from people using the data. And one of the biggest complaints that I've heard and maybe all of you have heard is that, you know, that people don't know what data is out there. And so if you're looking for business value, it is connecting the business to the data through the information that we have available about the data. And the, the glossary, the dictionary, the catalog are the wave of the future. Uh, they've actually been around for a while, but it seems to be some of the most uh, important buzz words and, and most important topics being discussed in, uh, in sessions like this and, and at the university in general. And I think we have time to slip in one or two more questions here and keep the questions coming. I will send them over to Bob uh, after the webinar for him to write up the answers, which will be included in the follow up email. So, uh, Bob, um, early on, you talked about market code is written as and it's written as business attribute and element. What's the difference? Well, you know, and, and that's really that's specific to the organization. So. Um, market code was listed as being a, a, a business term. What do we mean by uh, the market, uh, market code? And maybe even that code is made up of multiple pieces of information. There's the code itself. There's the description of the code. It's who entered the code. It's who updated the code. When was the last day that this was updated? What was the source of the information from the code? So market code might be more of a general term. And when we get down into the business elements, those are the specific pieces of information that we have about the market about the market code. I'm glad you asked that question because that is one of the first questions I typically get 
from sharing that framework is you have them listed as being the same thing, um, but one can be considered a term. You can have a different name for it or use the same name, um, but, but that was a good call out. And, and typically there is multiple pieces of information available about any specific term. Bob, thank you so much for another great presentation, but I'm afraid that is all the time we have for today. Again, lots of great questions we didn't get a chance to get to, so keep them coming. I will get them over to Bob to be included in the follow-up email by, that will go out to all registrants by end of day Monday with links to the slides and the recording. I also include a link to all the matrices and everything that Bob um, provides, as well as a link to his new um, online training available on data catalogs, dictionaries, and glossaries. So th thanks everybody for the great participation as always. Thanks, Bob, and I hope everybody stays safe out there. Thanks all. Thanks everybody. Take care now. <laughs>